thank you uh, for making the time for uh, the people who are uh, in the webinar. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, this topic is near and dear to my heart. It's very, very relevant right now with what we're going through, but I've been looking at how people navigate uncertain transitions for about a decade now. Uh, and I do it in a way um, as that is related to something called action research, which means that I run a consultancy where I actually help people to navigate changes in order to learn about what it takes for people to navigate changes. Uh, and uh, as a result, I've uh, spoken to over the years, uh, many hundreds of people and over the course of the past three to three and a half weeks, um, I, I'm coming up on a hundred people that I've spoken to one-on-one -on -one to try to understand how they're coping with and navigating this time. So uh, we'll talk about some of what I've learned uh, both over the years and in the past month or so. So let's dive in. Um, I really want to start, I really want to start, there we go. Uh, I really want to start uh, by challenging this uh, notion <laughs> that we've had uh, recently where I think uh, it's really, really hard to do a Google search about anything related to what we're dealing with right now uh, that doesn't in some way relate um, or, or refer to what we're going through as some kind of a new normal. And I think that some people are getting some initial um, psychological comfort from the notion of going from panic to a new normal, right? If you, if you really go back and do uh, an assessment and look through how people have talked about what's happening over the course of the last month, we went from everyone is panicking, everyone is panicking, mm -hmm. to now we're in the new normal, we're in the new normal. And those two notions, those two framings of what we're dealing with um, really speak to a lot of what I have seen in my research over time. So before we even press in, what I'd like to do is just invite everyone who's on, uh, on the call to just stop for a minute. And uh, if you have a piece of paper handy, and if you don't, take a second to get some paper, something to write on, something to play with, because a lot of what we're going to be uh, talking about will be reflective, and I will give some time. This is uh, meant to be interactive, not a lecture. Uh, and so my hope is that by the time you come off of the call, not only will you have thought through some of these things for yourself, but that you'll have some tools to be thinking them through both for yourselves and those who you serve in whatever uh, form that you're uh, helping and assisting people at this time, which I think most of us are trying to do. So my first prompt, my first question is uh, to ask you to just think about um, what, if you were to consider this a new normal, is that something that's helpful to you as a framing? Is it something that's unhelpful to you as a framing? Have you not thought about it before? What do you think about new normal? And some Danielle uh, on in the chat said, I feel like I've heard the concept about a decade ago, but this is truly a new normal. And I think that's interesting because about a decade ago was when we were in a recession, a very large global recession. So this idea of coming into a fear, right, this and, and managing our fear by considering ourselves in a new normal is a sensible, it, it, it makes sense that we do it. I'm going to explore with you today whether it's necessarily helpful to do that. Now, I see Andouar said new normal is adapting, right? It's part of the beginning of the process of adapting to a circumstance, right? So we had this time before, then we had this disruption, and now we are in the territory after that. And uh, we'll talk a lot on this uh, in the next hour about what that can look like. Any other uh, thoughts or comments from anyone on this? And there will be other times uh, through the webinar where I'll, where I'll ask you for your thoughts and, and not only just asking for your thoughts to get engagement and interaction, it, I, I really do want to open up some space. We only have an hour. Typically I would do a session like this in maybe three hours. Um, and in some ways I do it sometimes over three days in retreat settings, right? So this is a lot to ask in a short period of time. 
Uh, so I'm just introducing some thoughts for contemplation, not necessarily to solve a problem here. So if, if we move forward, um, I'd like to just show you um, a model that's uh, emerged out of my work. And, um, you know, it's hand drawn for a reason uh, because this is not um, fancy uh, thought leader guru stuff here. Um, this is insights that exist and are emerging from this work that I've been doing that really what I was setting out to do initially was to get a better understanding of why people didn't get where they were trying to go. And it was a very broad research question that I had that really began with thinking about um, the very popular notion about 10 or 12 years ago about how millennials were failing to launch. And it was uh, all over the news and blogosphere, and uh, we were getting very comfortable with talking about millennials not mm -hmm. launching. And the reasons that we were given were very uh, simple and somewhat condescending. They weren't launching because they were helicopter parented or because they were entitled or because they didn't have, um, you know, they didn't have a work ethic. There were all different reasons that, uh, that were given about why millennials were failing to launch. And that was not what I was observing in the young people that I was dealing with. Um, I was observing them not launching in ways that we would traditionally call launching, uh, but the reasons weren't holding up. And so I began to dig deep into that community of people. I also started digging into other communities of ambitious people who had visions uh, for doing good in the world who were being prevented for a variety of reasons. And of course, I found the typical reasons. I found that there were systemic challenges, there were network challenges, there were socioeconomic challenges. Uh, there were no surprises there. Uh, what I did uncover that was surprising and as a service designer may, gave me pause and made me want to, to ask more questions was that the point at which they were hitting some complex decision making or disruption. Their tools that they had, goal setting, uh, developing plans, executing on plans, the tools that we typically give people for um, growing and succeeding, were really falling short because of how complex uh, the scope of the decisions that they had to make had become. And part of that was technology, but it wasn't all technology. Part of it uh, had to do a lot with cultural shifts. Uh, if you really go backward, you know, 50 years, uh, people didn't have as many decisions to make. Uh, by and large, uh, people were going to get married uh, probably before they were 23, definitely before they were 25. They would aspire to have children. They would aspire to have a house. Uh, there was a very common cultural notion of what success looked like and what it meant to pursue it. Um, also, uh, it was very typical to get a job and stay in that job for 10 or 20 or 30 years. In fact, even at the beginning of my career, um, I'm 53 years old, so I was entering into the workforce in the late 80s and early 90s. And even as recently as then, if you were jumping from job to job, you were considered a job hopper, and that actually said something negative about your character in the workforce. Today, it really is shifted to the point where uh, sometimes if people stay in a job for too long, it says something about their aspirations because we flattened organizations to such a degree that you really can't move up the corporate ladder that we traditionally had thought about and that you really have to take a more latticed approach to moving through things. So what that's meant is that young people were making more decisions more frequently and with more choices at the point of decision. And ultimately, we as human beings are not that great at choices, especially when they're complex. And so that led to this model that we'll talk through a little bit, and then we'll do some reflection as we go. So let me just begin with where we actually find ourselves right now. And that is in this place of disruption. 
Now, right now we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with a very particular kind of disruption. But over the past month, it's been really interesting for me to see that the reactions and the responses that people are having to this disruption are really not any different than what I've uh, explored in the research over the course of the past 10 years. We really actually have a pretty uh, consistent response uh, to disruption. And that is the fundamental initial kind of panic state that people get into. Uh, and that I call in my work a what now moment, right? So any disruption it, it can lead us into a what now moment. And you'll notice actually on, on this that I, I purposefully put kind of jagged on one side and curved on the other because our response to disruption when we have something like losing a job or something really dramatic like we're dealing with on the negative side is also replicated when we have a disruption like getting married, have a disruption like finding out we're having a child. There's some real consistency about how we, how we operate in the world when our status quo has been blown up in any kind of way. And that leads us into this time of questioning, right? But our initial response to that questioning has a lot to do with whether we have a clear or an uncertain notion of how we're going to respond or get out of or get through or get to the other side of whatever that what now moment is. And so if it's clear, if we have a, a very, okay, this thing, how, oh, I am getting married. I know exactly what we're going to do. We've thought about it. We've planned for it. This is something that I don't have a lot of anxiety or uncertainty about. Then we have a number of tools to use to be able to then go plan our wedding and do our things. If it's an uncertain kind of a what now moment, uh, my parents just called me and said that one of them is ill and they now need to move in with me and my family. Well, that kind of a what now moment tends to place us in a different kind of a mindset. And that different kind of a mindset can lead us into uncertainty, a lack of clarity, and gets us really knocked into our responsive reactive and that's that fear freeze flight and freaking out in a lot of cases that we do at the point of hitting that what now moment i'd like to just stop there for a minute and uh and and see your beautiful faces and see if anybody has any questions or thought at this stage um of, of just thinking about how you have been thinking about this what now moment that we're all facing right now, not so much in its specificity of how have I been dealing with the practical matter of, you know, shifting to work from home, but more of a reflective notion of how has your own personal response to that translated into action or inaction when you've kind of been hit with this uncertainty. And you can just take time for you to reflect yourself or if anybody has anything they'd like to share, that's perfectly fine. But I think it's good to take a beat in the midst of this so that we can reflect on this being, okay, disruption, what now? And then is there a certain or an uncertain way forward? What have you seen in that process, either in yourself or in others? I mean, I see a couple of hands going up. I know no one, everybody doesn't have the video on, but this, that paralysis is a very typical response. I think also um, I've been watching a lot of people um, within days, people had content up, product out, new courses mm -hmm. up, right? Free this, free that, mm -hmm. go out, right? Within days, within 24 hours, 48 hours, right? That is actually very much like the paralysis, believe it or not, <laughs> right? Because this work um, took me into the psychology literature, of course, the sociology, the anthropology, et cetera. But one really interesting place that the work took me is into the literature on what people do when they actually get lost, like lost in the woods. 
And there is a surprising amount of research about uh, what people do when they get lost in the woods be, that is done by the people who are charged with finding people when they're lost in the woods, right? So they want to get an insight into where they might look if people have been um, you know, lost on the backwoods, whatever it might be. And um, the literature really meets out that when people are lost in the woods, they do this very same human thing. So they find some people curled up at the bottom of a tree right near where they got lost and they just kind of stick in place. And then there's some people who retrace their steps Right, so that's like, let's get back to normal, right? So that's a kind of, I wanna get back to normal. Um, I would say the new normal is kind of the stick in place, right? Because even as we've talked about a new normal, we've said, because this gives me something that I can think about being in the present. So it orients us to the present. And then there, uh, and I was really interested to learn that there's a community of people that when they're lost, they actually run. And they run in any direction with no thinking, sometimes up to a mile. And many times they run until they collapse. And those people actually are the ones who um, most frequently do not get found. Because when the search party comes in, they really have no reason to think that they would be a mile away in a random direction. And so they wind up out of the search <laughs> grid, right? And so it's a really, really interesting, um, if we zoom out uh, as I tend to do, because this is what I do, um, I've watched people stay, people really kind of go into, we're gonna be back to normal any day now, right? We'll all be out golfing very soon, et cetera. <laughs> and the people who have really rushed to action, now, rushing to action in the first few days, that really is helpful because people are trying to find their grounding. But at some point, moving from, I have to get comfortable that what was is no longer. But there's a diminishing return of the new normal notion when we're dealing with a threshold that actually will end because what it does is places us in thinking about this as a new normal now that, and, and it, it can hold us back from beginning to think about the locus of possibilities and opportunities and um, not even opportunities, challenges we might face as we start to have a forward look. And so I've been watching very closely because the new normal helpful to stay here, but if we don't begin to also consider our creative, you know, engage our curiosity and our creativity, thinking about, well, what are the problems that may be caused here for me personally, for my family unit, for my community, for my teams at work, whatever it might be, concentric circles out from myself to the world or concentric circles in for those of us who are predisposed to start with the world and in. But the point is that if we just create new routines that we now stick to in so, until someone tells us it's over and then begin to think about what we will do now that someone has told us it's over, we may be missing an opportunity to, not opportunity to how are we going to produce on the other end of this, which I think some people go to, but really an opportunity to engage in some sense making here. Because this is less about what decisions, when we get into what now moment space, into these threshold spaces between what was and what will be, the tools that, we, that like I said, goal setting, execution, decision making, the tools that work really, really well when we actually are more certain, don't work as well in these middle spaces. So we can call it a new normal if that gives us some psychological safety. But I'm inviting you to consider that that new normal is also generative space. This can also be a time of really thinking about 
and making sense of what was and what could and may be, both positive and negative, right? So this requires some internal work to make sure that we're managing our emotional state, but also some external work of really being honest about what was and what will be and beginning to play in that space. And it is a place of play and, and creativity and curiosity if we'll let it be. There's a big insight from my work and even some of the, the things that we'll talk about um, shortly um, are some models that, that I developed um, because we're not trained. We really are much more trained and acculturated, at least in the United States and in many Western contexts. Uh, to get through the uncertainty quickly, right? Right. We, we pay CEOs a lot of money to get us past and through back into kind of solid ground. That is wonderful if it's an option. We are in a circumstance where it is not an option. And as a result, we really need to understand what are the tools that we use when we are in uncertain time, particularly prolonged uncertain time, and it's funny, I think it was Nadia um, who mentioned it. Um, my, my husband is also uh, not from the United States, from a South American country uh, where he grew up under a dictatorship. And that adaptive training is something that is um, much more available to people who have grown up with constant uncertainty than it is for people who have I will say, held the illusion of having certainty, as many countries in the West have done. Um, I think uncertainty has always been there, but it's easy to get the illusion that, that it's not. So if we press through in the model, uh, this, this shape is really meant to um, represent that kind of, it's uncertain, and now, to your point, Ingo, I'm, I'm doubling down on the, the emotion of it. I'm doubling down on the discomfort of it. I'm, and, and interestingly, back to that um, research on people being lost, um, it is quoted over and over in many papers and articles. Everyone panics, right? A a even well, well-trained backwoods um, uh, people who wind up in avalanche comes and they find themselves off the trail that they expected to be, who are well equipped, they've got things in their backpack to get them out. The initial response, actually everyone panics, but everyone's panic uh, manifests in different ways. Again, this acting or not acting and so on and so forth. But that's a, kind of a natural human response to a major uncertainty. What we are, what I'm inviting you to uh, based upon the research that I've done with the people that I've worked with, is that there is a tremendous opportunity here at this intersection. If we stay in that fear, frustration, anger, right? In essence, negative emotional space, consciously or unconsciously, what we do is we actually amplify the, the disorientation, distraction, and despair that we feel in the wake of the uncertainty and actually bring ourselves right back in this circle of disruption and more what nows and more uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's actually a downward emotional spiral. And the, the, the psychology literature is really clear on this that we know that negative emotion creates a downward spiral. And we know actually from the positive psychology literature, and I know you have someone speaking about positive psychology, I think maybe next week, or maybe it was before this. So I'm sure that there's a recording here somewhere, Ingo. But positive emotions actually create, do something called broaden and build. They make us more creative, and they actually open us up and they build upon one another. So I've done a lot of research on gratitude, delight, and now curiosity. And these things build upon each other and actually can help to raise us. And so this is the, th this intersection, let me go back, right here 
this is where we find ourselves on this webinar today, right? As a nation, as a world. How do we navigate this particular intersection? And what are the tools that we need to navigate this particular intersection? Because, and this doesn't mean be brave, be curious, and this is what we do. We tend at this moment, this is, this is the point in the process where we go to prescriptives. And we have blogs that are two paragraphs and then a list of 10 things that you should do. And we add a to-do list to people when they are already at the height of busyness, emotional dis discomfort, et cetera. And so in, in the, what I'm inviting you to is to not get into this, oh, if I meditate every day, if I do this, like a to-do list, not helpful. What is helpful here is to come to a place of self-reflection to just understand where we stand at this point of intersection. To acknowledge, oh, I, I think it was great. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Let me open up and maybe I can get it. Um, was uh, I'm sorry, uh, name isn't coming up, but that you were talking about being paralyzed, right? Often what will happen is I'm being paralyzed. So now how do I find out how to not be paralyzed, right? This tends to be how we've been trained or I'm depressed. So now I have to put my focus on how do I not be depressed or anxious or whatever it is that that feeling is. And we, we kind of hold ourselves up in the feelings part of this. We actually have far more agency than we tend to think to separate those feelings from the actions that we choose to take and the way that we choose to make sense of the circumstances we're in. And I think we're actually getting a great example of that watching our healthcare workers and our first responders deal to these circumstances. And so I view this intersection we're talking about as being a real triage kind of intersection, right? This is a moment when you're an emergency room nurse or you're an emergency room doctor in any circumstances, not just COVID-19. When, when that door opens and people start to come in, and my, my sister happens to be uh, an ER nurse for many years, um, and, and those doors open, it is not that those folks are not emoting and not emoting deeply. Uh, same, my father was a New York City firefighter, right? Anyone who winds up in this, because they actually live in the what now moments. Every time the bell rings and they suit up and jump on the back of a truck, they're operating in the world of what now moments. But their ability to triage in that moment and to hold their emotions here while they enter into the space of making sense of the circumstance and acting in appropriate ways. But then returning to these emotions and caretaking as necessary, that is a skill worthy of exploration at this time. So it's not about no one being scared or depressed during this time. I am not going to sit here and say, be brave, end of webinar because that's really difficult. And actually, you may be quite frightened throughout this one month, two months, three months, but you also will have things to do and you will also have functioning that you need to do. So how can we uncouple the emotional response and then do a real assessment of where are we really strong in this situation? And do we, are we well-resourced? Where are we not well-resourced emotionally, physically, materially? And this really goes to resiliency work. And if we had more time, I'd go deeper into that, but I'm sorry, we really don't. But resilience is not just about bouncing back emotionally and being strong and rugged in a time like this. It's actually, in, in its deepest kind of research sense, and I, I draw upon the research of, of a gentleman named Michael Unger at the Resilience Research Center in Canada. And so if you want to dig deeper there, email me, I can give you more on that and even some tools around that. But the notion of reflecting on oneself and saying, where do I have 
Um, where do I feel very grounded in this situation? Where do I feel less grounded and that I have, you know, unsettled under my feet? And then how might I navigate and negotiate to get the resources that I need in order to place some um, firm, something firm under my feet? And it may not be ideal firm under my feet, but enough so that I'm at least getting a grounding upon which I can begin to build. And that, I think, is the brilliance of the new normal as a framing. I just don't think it's where we want to stay. I think it's what we want to do to, to kind of just bring some, some, some floor under our feet, but then, okay, now that I have something that I can lean on, what now, right? It's the second level of what now once I have my grounding. And I think that that's where we'll be for the next, over the next two to three weeks and that it will be really, really important for people to be intentional about attempting to make that turn. Because otherwise, and, and my more recent research this week into what I hear over and over again, I'm bored, it's like Groundhog Day. I'm bored, it's like Groundhog Day. And I don't know if everybody is, you know, familiar with that rec reference because it's a movie reference. But what it means is I wake up every morning and it's as if I'm living the same day over and over again. And that over time will numb us to creativity and it will numb us to really, we need as many people as we possibly can have equipped and being creative about how to build and shape what is next as we can have because this is a very grand circumstance and we will have to be rebuilding not just from the top down but from our homes and our communities up and i'm very i i have a deep heart for helping to equip as many individuals as i can to be that bottom up and, and that's what we're, we're seeking to do today any questions or thoughts on that before i move on this intersection between fear and curiosity and how we might navigate there. Um, so this intersection, the, the, the curiosity fear, um, this notion of opening, there's a reason that I use a door here, and that is because I really, really want to double down on this notion of a threshold, right? We've gone through a threshold, the disruption created a, a threshold that happened to us. Shifting from fear to curiosity gives us a threshold that we begin to have some agency with, right? So we can begin to ask ourselves as we try to make sense of this, some questions. And when we talk about navigating flux, and that's really what we're talking about here, sense making at this stage is key and critical. We are very undereducated in sense making because we tend to rush to decisions. Uh, we are very confident in our ability to quickly assess circumstances and then move forward and make decisions on them. And when we have this kind of open new territory, you can think about this as traveling like a pioneer right? You say, okay, I want to go west to seek my fortune. Well, what does that mean? There's many possible routes that we can take. There's many different challenges that I might face. So how do I wake up every day and make sense of my circumstance, not necessarily trying to create new routines that will be hard and fast? Try a new routine today. Maybe that works for three days. Then on the fourth day, it starts to make me feel like I'm unsettled. Great. Start a new routine. Continue to adapt routines in times of extended uncertainty. That's one way to keep going. Also, we want to really recognize that this is about being disoriented. This is not about figuring out what to do. It is about acknowledging that we are disoriented. Again, going back to that metaphor of being lost. When we are lost in the woods, what we are is disoriented. And as a result, even if we don't have a set place that we intend to go, we have to get ourselves reoriented. We use that term, oh, let me get my bearings, 
right? Getting my bearings is a, an orientation kind of a notion. And that's something that we need to be thinking about when we're in this kind of space. We use the notion of having a true north in many, many of the models that say, how do you succeed? How do you get forward? Well, you need to find your true north. You need to find your purpose. You need to find your why. This notion that there is some kind of a, a singular beacon toward which we can navigate that's really built, right, in 18th century navigation. But people navigated for millennia before we had compasses and a sense of a magnetic north. And they did it differently. And in times of flux, we actually don't have a true north. Right now, we don't have a true north of we want to get to this ideal. Because we actually have, everything has kind of unsettled for us and we recognize everyone really is talking a lot about how things will not be the same there will be many changes to the way that we operate and do things when we get to the other side of this situation so it's more helpful for us to begin to lay out a constellation of values and things that we are going to navigate by not simply a singular true north and actually, my research shows that a lot of people, even in the best of times, don't have a true north. There are many people who are wandering, trying to understand how they want to navigate the world using multiple different points of entry to do so. And the true north, in the same way as the new normal, can sometimes be unhelpful for them. So I'm inviting you to think about these metaphors and find the metaphor. Many people, I say, well, forget about the stars. Use a, use a gardening metaphor if that's better for you. Use a, they, it really doesn't matter what metaphors we use because metaphors are just a way that we try to help ourselves make sense of things. Got a question in the chat. Oh, just, just accolades, thank you very much. <laughs> Hang on. I put I don't know on this slide because I actually believe that these are three of the most critical words for navigating flux. We are very, very uncomfortable with the notion of not knowing. We favor people who have a clear sense of what to do. It's the kind of leader that we promote. It's the kind of um, people that we elevate into um, our, our thought leadership spaces, right? We seek people who know what to do, and that's who we want to follow. But more and more, both in these dramatic times and even in less dramatic times, we face a lot of things that we just don't know. And as a result of that, I've been really starting to dig down into humility as a research area because really trying to understand what it means to be teachable. We talk about needing to be lifelong learners, but we haven't really yet started to connect the fact that being a lifelong learner mm -hmm. means acknowledging that we are going to have to learn, which means that there's a lot of things that we don't know. And so mm -hmm. it's very, very powerful and helpful at this intersection of fear and curiosity to begin to tell, okay, I don't know what to do, right? But the tone in which we say it, right? If we're like, I don't know what to do, that gives us one kind of a reaction. But if we move into, I don't know what to do. Okay, I don't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, you learn, you explore, you question, you research, you ask others, right? And so it begins to open up a set of activities that moves us from I don't know, and that really just the uncomfortable kind of I don't know, to an I don't know, but let's find out. So how might we deal with a higher education setting that uh, can't go back to school in September, let's say? How might we think about educating our, our, our children in these kind of, right? These, these become questions that we don't have to really figure out and come up with an answer to by Friday, but more an exploration that we can have with our children, with our organizations, and with people 
from now weekly learning and and adapting to what we learn as we move forward and there's something about that and my research makes this quite clear just that shift from i don't know what to do but i don't know what to do but let's find out and let's get curious and let's explore can help to take the emotional pressure off of having to do it right or that there is going to be tragedy if i do it wrong it's more let's see what works for us let's recognize that what works for me might not work for you what works for you might not work for me but that you can be exploring how to get that ground under your feet and then how to begin to look beyond where we are right now even though we don't have a clear true north to guide us at the moment so this is a tool that we can only go a touch into, uh, but it's something that I wanna leave you with. And obviously it'll be in the presentation that, um, that Ingo sends to you, but I can also send a PDF with that uh, if it would be helpful. Um, this model, um, think of this model as a bit of a compass, a compass for what now moments, a compass for that time that we're trying to enter the threshold of curiosity from the kind of responsive fear place when we encounter what now moments. And I use this with companies, I use this with individuals, I use this with teams. I use this for mundane challenges. I use this for very dramatic and serious challenges. It's very much decontextualized and can operate at high and low levels of, um, of seriousness and scope. There's no place to start. You can start on this any place that you'd like. And it just is a set of creative prompts for you to think about where you are and make sense of it. Uh, but the notion is that some people really know what they hope for, right? They, they, on that top level, on that top line, they are really clear. But then, it, so it's say, I hope for there to be no more poverty in the world, which is a great aspiration, a great hope. But many of those people then, when it comes to doing something about it, wind up kind of being very scattershot about it. So I'll take a person like that who has a very clear long-term vision or larger vision and say, okay, great, but what problem do you wanna solve? Because poverty is a very, very complex, multivariate challenge. And so they say, well, I don't know what problem I wanna solve. Well, do you know whose problem you want to solve? Do you know why you're the right person to solve it? And that's a really important one to keep us from going out and solving problems that we're not the best people to solve. And then and only then do I ask people to think about how they solve it. Mostly we start in the bottom right-hand corner. What now, how do we solve this problem? Before we've really understood where do we uniquely have the interest, the insights, the skills, the network, the resources to actually make an impact. And so we're using this as a way to guide. So in this moment, a lot of people have a desire to help. And I think that that's admirable. However, I also think that it can become problematic for people. I call this the kind of bringing a casserole after someone's passed away kind of model. For the first two or three days, bringing food to people who have had a loss is really helpful. At some point, two weeks in, when the freezer is full of lasagnas and the refrigerator is full of lasagnas and the lasagnas on the countertop, the fact that we're helping in ways that actually aren't helpful can actually add to people's burden. So using this model, is something that I'm inviting you to just explore as a means to be making sense of where you are. And this can be what problem about your homeschooling your children or what problem about people in your neighborhood having needs or what problem for your own self with your own anxiety or challenge. So let me open up again and uh, just ask if anybody, I know we're coming close to time, has any questions or, or thoughts about this that I can clarify. If we were working together, right, what I would be inviting you to do is spend this week keeping some kind of a diary, but something easy, 
like phone notes, like whatever your, you know, whatever you do that is the most natural way for you to capture an understanding of your own experience, right? Because I think, again, the prescriptives, well, what you should do is you should, you know, meditate at noon every day. I don't know whether you should meditate at noon every day. I don't, right? I don't know anyone on this webinar well enough to tell anyone what they should do and how they should manage themselves. I'm more interested in, can you become more self-aware of the rhythm of your own ups and downs so that you can come to see if you have patterns Maybe it happens every time you sit on the computer for more than three hours or every time you're finished with your emails or right? whatever it is that you're finding is your own barrier to progress or that throws you into the emotional cycle or whatever your barrier. Because some people might be on this call and saying, actually, my emotions aren't the problem. What my problem is, is that I'm not going to have enough money to pay my rent on money. And maybe I'm not emotional about that. Maybe I am quite level headed about it but I still don't know what to do, right? I don't know how I'm going to go pay my bills. Well, fine. So now let's start to explore and get curious about all of the possible ways that one might attack that, right? So this isn't just about the emotional. Right now, I think many people are on emotional and that initial panic is always emotional, right? So emotions are quite important and that's why I study resilience. But once we uncouple the emotions from the circumstances, now what starts to happen is we need to dig deep into an understanding and making sense of the circumstances because probably there are specific circumstances that are driving that emotion that you find yourself in again in the afternoon. And so if we can begin to make sense of them, again, I keep going back to sense-making, what we're doing is we're taking this big complex ball of, of thread, right? That when we look at that big complex ball of thread, we're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go, uh, right? And we're actually just beginning to untangle it and understand it. And if you've ever tried to untangle something like that or it chains in a jewelry box or something like that, you'll be able to untangle until you hit that one place where it's not moving, it is not budging. And so, now we have to have a tactic. Do I go and try the other side for a little while until I get to the other way? Do I do, right? Questions, 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 experimentation, experimentation. Oh, got a little bit? Great. Now I can move forward, right? So we're just constantly untangling, asking questions. And it won't happen intuitively at first because it's not how we've been trained. So what we'll need is some um, crutches. And I say that without judgment, right? We need to create our own crutches. And that's the heart and the soul of resilience, right? That's where I was saying earlier, we need to learn how to negotiate. We have to get the resources we need. So if I know that, for instance, if I knew uh, that in Zoom, I hate to see myself on video. This is happening to a lot of people. I hate to see myself on video and I don't like my voice. And now they're forced to spend six, eight hours a day on, on Zoom, that's, that's an added challenge, right? So how might I do, that becomes a question, how might I, instead of I can't. And just that shift from I can't do this, I won't be able to pay, to how might I do this, how might I pay, shifts us naturally to curiosity instead of saying, Ingo, just be more curious, because that's not helpful. So let's say um, you say, oh, you know, Paul has a good idea there. Let me do a, a, a diary. And let's say you get to the end of day one and you didn't do your diary. And then you're laying in bed and saying, damn it, I didn't do my diary. And then you get to the end of day two and you're like, damn it, I didn't do my diary. Then a diary is not a good idea for you. This isn't about, so now I feel guilty because I didn't do the diary. This just means that that's not the right way for you. I don't actually keep diaries very well, but I'm very good about keeping a set of post-it notes in my, in my pocket or in my bag. And every time I get an idea about these things, I throw an idea in a post-it note and later when I'm in my office, I put it on the wall. 
but I wouldn't sit here and build a program around it so that I tell you that that's what you should do. I can share it as a possible experiment that you might run for yourself. But this is about getting to know oneself and then learning to curate the tools that work for us instead of taking the this model and trying to adapt ourselves to it and the this model and trying to adapt ourselves to it because the research is clear that we fail at that all the time and then we feel guilty. So if, if we're in a scientist mindset, an experimental mindset, everything we try is a success whether we fail or we succeed. It doesn't matter because we've learned, right? If, if everything we try, the, the goal or the objective is to learn as opposed to the goal or the objective is to get it right. <laughs> because otherwise our scientists, you know, the first time the light bulb didn't work would have been, I'm a failure, off I go. But no, you keep, every failed experiment is a learning that informs the next experiment and we move on and we move forward and we're, we're kind of narrowing into our way. And that's why this is called a field guide to finding your way. Because that's what I'm an advocate of, not to do it Joan's way, but to recognize that there's a power and agency in developing our own approaches to these times and that we actually can engage that, not to be empowered by others, but to empower our own selves, our families, our communities, and then where we choose to have impact beyond them.